Well, hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs on this lovely Wednesday, March 29th. Uh, we are here this morning uh, to uh, hear uh, some introductory testimony on S9, and I want to welcome Senate GovOps Chair, Senator Ruth Hardy. So thanks for being here this morning. Thank you, Representative McCarthy. Thanks for having me. Good to see everybody. Um, so S9 is a bill about the authority of the state auditor to examine the books and records of state contractors. Um, the, the impetus of this bill was, as you might know, a, a Vermont Supreme Court case last year, Hoffer D1 Care, um, that was um, uh, brought because the auditor was trying to get um, to audit the books and records of One Care Vermont, um, the state's accountable care organization. And um, they refused to provide the information that the auditor, auditor requested, and it ended up in a legal battle that went to the Vermont Supreme Court. Um, so I highly recommend reading the case. Um, and um, I actually I'm on the Judicial Retention Committee, and we um, uh, had the U.S. or at the Vermont Supreme Court in this year for retention. So I talked to the justice who wrote the decision um, about it. So you can also watch that. But um, uh, Becky will also take you through the case um, if you request it, um, so you can understand sort of the nuances of why we ended up here. Um, and um, basically, the the court found that for the purposes of auditing state contracts with the state, um, the auditor was not determined to be an agent of the state, um, which is a little curious because he's the state auditor um, and uh, a statewide elected official. Um, so um, the but the court found that if the if the legislature wants to provide this um, uh, authority to the auditor, we know how to do that. Um, and that the, that the legislature knows how to provide authority to state officials and to do so through legislation. So that's what this bill is, um, us exercising our legislative um, power. Um, so S9 uh, adds to the auditor's um, authority, the, the ability to um, Secure, uh, to request the records, accounts, books, papers, reports, and returns. Um, and that is language that is equivalent to the language that is used for the auditor's authority to audit other entities, um, state agencies, et cetera. So that's the same language um, that is already in the statutes for the auditor's authority. Um, and we, that, so that the auditor could audit the records, uh, accounts, books, papers, reports, and returns acquired um, from contractors. And the specific thing that's really important is that it's for the performance of the contract only. So if this is if there's a contract with the state to, you know, build a table, it's only the stuff that's relevant to the contract to build that table. It's not all the other stuff about the contract uh, from the contractor. So we we were really we got uh, in testimony that language um, suggested it wasn't in the original bill and we added performance of the contract. And that makes it very clear that it's um, you know relevant to what the state is paying the contractor to do um, that that the auditor would be able to um, do an audit. Um, so you'll see that repeated in the bill several times. Um, the other thing I would um, uh, th suggest is that you get some testimony on Bulletin 3.5, um, because this also uh, uh, requires the um, Secretary of Administration um, to include in Bulletin 3.5, which is the um, state's uh, um, parameters, uh, uh, rules, et cetera, and they'll explain it better than I can about contracting. Um, so you'll get into the weeds of how the state does contracting. So, um, I, uh, and this requires that the auditor be included in that. So already anybody who contracts with the state in, the, in Bulletin 3.5, 
says that they can be audited. Um, but it's audited by the state agency, apparently, not by the auditor. It's kind of weird. Um, so this is saying in Bulletin 3.5, be specific to add that the, audit, the auditing means that the auditor can also do the auditing, not just the agency with, which, with whom you're contracting. Um, and um, finally, we, we did also um, bring Tucker Anderson in to talk to us about public records requests and how this interacts with public records requests, because there was a concern that um, once the auditor does get some of this information, that it could be subject to public records requests. And Tucker can walk you through the nuances of how the, pu the Public Records Act works with the these kinds of records. And the auditor can walk you through the sort of um, provisions that his depart his agent or his office does um, for public records. Um, um, Finally, there's a provision in here um, that Becky can explain to you probably better than me, but is was requested by the bank, the Bankers Association, um, that is um, that allows for them. It's it's section two of the bill, I believe. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, Becky will explain to you where it is. Section four of the bill <laughs> um, that um, allow so banking records are covered by federal law, and unless there's an explicit explicit permission to provide those banking records, it's a violation of federal law. So um, Christelia came in and requested this language so that banks can comply with the audits without being in violation of federal law. Um, so um, he can explain that, and so can Becky better than I can, but. Um, uh, that um, is the, the basic gist of the things. Um, we did, um, we got a lot of testimony um, and we tried to respond to as many of the concerns as possible and, and while still moving the bill forward. Um, we feel like it's really important that the auditor be able to audit um, uh, the records, books, et cetera, of what first relevant to state contracts. A lot of state funding is put out there in contracts. And if the auditor doesn't have access to it, then that's leaving a whole slew of public money that is not um, being able to be audited by our state auditor, which is his constitutional duty as the state auditor. And um, I think also it's important to understand this is not about the current auditor or the past auditor or the next auditor. It's about this, the office of the auditor in general and what the authority of that office is as an, the elected statewide auditor and the ability to ensure that public funding is used um, in an effective, efficient and, you know, uh, the way that it was supposed to be used for the performance of a contract. Um, we got some last minute um, uh, concerns about the bill that um, frankly, I think were a lot very overblown. So um, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> for example. Thank you, Senator. Uh, did you say that the individual departments still retain the ability to do an audit themselves? It's not supplanted by this authority given to the auditor. Correct. Good. Senator Marwicki. Thanks for coming in. Sure. Um, can you say more to the concerns that were raised? Yes. You might want to be aware of. I'm sure you'll hear a lot about this, but um, there were concerns raised by um, the administration that this would prevent um, people from contracting with the state, that they would be afraid they were going to be audited and they would therefore not want to contract with the state. And they had a lot of kind of fear mongering, frankly, about it. Any other questions for Senator Hardy? Representative Byron. Just following up with that. So were there, aside from the administration, were there other organizations, any trade associations or any groups that represent? We heard- That contract with the state that were- Yeah, we heard the, from- Breadth of this expansion. Thanks for that question. We heard from general contractors of 
Association of Vermont. We, we heard from the hospitals. We heard from, uh, I can't remember all the lists, but, um, and what, when we added the, the performance of the contract language, that seemed to quell a lot of the um, concerns. There, you know, there was a concern that it was really broad and that the auditor could be asking for information about anything. Um, and um, so when we made it specific to the performance of the contract, that um, made um, them feel much better that it was just going to be about building the table <laughs> and not about anything else they were doing. There were also, um, once we heard from Tucker about the um, Public Records Act and what what is able to be kept confidential, and um, you know there were there were concerns about trade secrets, there were concerns about you know, personal personnel information, there were concerns about um, medical records, um, but. You know, the 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 Public Records Act. There are there are things that are to remain confidential, even with that, and and still HIPAA still applies to medical records. It's not like we're, you know, the auditor's going to release personal medical records. The auditor already has a lot of this kind of information with other audits that the office does. Um, they already have medical records and um, you know confidential information, and they have a policy for dealing with it. Um, so I think that that we, you know, there were concerns initially, but once we clarified things and narrowed the scope, those concerns were quelled for the most part. It was the concern that the administration had about people not wanting to contract with the state because they might be audited, but already they could be audited. It's just a question of who audits them. And, you know, to be clear also, the, the audit would be, of the contract on both sides, you know, the, the contractor and the, you know, state's performance in the contract too. And, and so, um, you know, the, which the auditor already has access to state records. Um, so it's not, it, it was, it seemed, yeah, it seemed like an, a concern that could, was not necessarily, um, uh, a concern that needed to be had. <laughs> we'll, we'll, dig, we'll dig into the voices. Uh, yeah. So I want to make sure, um, since legislative council's got um, a, a time limit that we um, get a chance to actually walk through the language with Beth. Yeah. If, uh, is there anything else you want to leave us with, Senator? <laughs> um, uh, we also heard from, you know, uh, the, the health care advocate and others who were talking about how it was important that this these uh, contracts be audited to make sure that that the performance was what we needed for the state. So I think it's important to see both sides of it. Um, uh, the bill's pretty short, so it's just one of those bills that created a lot of discussion. <laughs> sure, we'll discuss it a lot. <laughs> Thank you all for taking it up. Thank you. Take care. And you obviously should hear from the auditor to hear what their procedures are. Okay. See him in the room, and he's on. He's there he on is. The <laughs> I didn't yeah. see Mr. Auditor. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Senator Hardy. Um, so I want to invite uh, Rebecca Wasserman of Legislative Council to, to come and just walk us through the words on the page. So thanks for being here, Becky. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. Um, so I will uh, turn to S9 as passed by the Senate, which is an act relating to the authority of the state auditor to examine the books and records of state contractors. Um, as Senator Hardy mentioned, there is a court case that sort of uh, motivated this language. So if you want me to speak to that, I can, but for now, I'll just start with the bill of that is how you want to proceed? Yeah, if, if, if it would help the committee understand the, the context, and, and I think a couple of folks join us late, it might be helpful just to give a brief summary of sort of what the One Care case was. And, okay. And I'm, sure, I'm sure the auditor and others will put me on the bones of that, but if you could say just sort of how this relates to that. Then. Sure. Um, so the auditor um, requested some records, some payroll records from One Care, and I can let the auditor speak to sort of the intricacies of it, um, which One Care uh, did not provide after several requests. And so then the auditor uh, brought a suit to, to say that there is a breach of the contract that One Care had with Diva, which 
allowed um, for auditing of certain accounts and records. And um, the contract with Diva had two auditing provisions. One was in the contract, and then one was part of what are the, the attached to every state contract, the standard um, sort of con standard um, terms and conditions that the state adds to contracts. Um, so both of those provisions, um, and I'm, I'm very much summarizing here, but both of those provisions do provide for um, having access to a contractor's accounting records, um, but it's the language in them is limited, limits it to authorized representatives of the state. And so the auditor's argument in the case was, you know, I'm the constitutional officer who performs government audits. So under this, the terms of this contract, you know, I, I'm an authorized representative who should have access to these records. And the court sort of looked at the auditor's statutory authority, which is what this bill is amending and said, um, you know, your statutory authority says that, um, you know, the auditor has the ability to audit departments, institutions, and agencies of the state, but does not specify that the auditor can audit contractors of the state. Um, and so sort of based on a look at the, the language in the contract, and there was no other language that sort of specified that in the contract that the auditor was, for the purposes of that contract, considered an authorized representative or sort of a third party beneficiary of the contract and looking at the statute that which did not um, does not give the auditor a sort of explicit statutory authority to look at the to access those records the court said we don't find that in this case that you have this authority but they did um, as Senator Hardy mentioned have uh, some language saying you know the legislature does know how to give this authority when they want to, and they also um, provided in the case some other examples of where the auditor was is given in statute sort of more explicit authority to audit other entities that are not, you know, sort of specified in this, uh, provided in this like general um, authority for the state um, departments, institutions, and agencies. Okay. I have to learn a lot more about what the auditor does on this committee uh, before we uh, really understand all that context, but I think that's a helpful intro into what's going on that drove this bill, so thanks. Um, okay, great. So um, to the language of the bill, section one is amending that statutory authority that I was just referring to, um, the duties of the, the auditor. Um, so one of the the duties specified in statute says that the auditor at their discretion um, can conduct governmental audits of every department, institution, and agency of the state. Um, so what the language change here is adding um, that this includes contractors as it relates to the performance of the contract with, this, with the state. So sort of expanding that and specifying that that auditing authority includes mm -hmm. contractors as, as the contract relates to the performance um, as the as it relates to the performance of the contract. And then on page two, there's a new subdivision 13 added to this statutory section for the duties of the auditor. Um, so the auditor has a discretion to examine the records, accounts, books, papers, reports, and returns in all formats of any contractor that provides services to the state, but there's sort of a limitation put on that. It says that provided that that examination is limited to those that are relevant to the performance of the contract of the state. So it's not um, sort of a wholesale ability to examine only where there's um, those records are, are relevant to the performance of the contract. And then um, the next sentence says that any records, accounts, books, papers, reports, and returns that the uh, auditor acquires during an examination um, that are not otherwise available to the public are exempt from public inspection and copying under the Public uh, Records Act. So this is um, the part that speaks to um, keeping exempt um, sort of confidential information that the auditor 
uh, could come across during one of these examinations. Um, section two is amending another statutory section um, related to the auditor about what records are available for audit. Um, so this is just uh, sort of lining up the change that was made in section 163. Um, because this section speaks to um, the examination authority that the auditor has um, with respect to the entities that the auditor can, can um, audit, it does not include that exception for contractors that is in subdivision 13 about um, the limitation that's placed on that examination of records. So this is just um, adding into the section that cross reference to, to sort of accept those particular uh, records from this uh, event, what records are available to the auditor. Page three, section three. Um, so this is uh, session law, it's not amending statute. It is um, directing the Secretary of Admi Administration to update Administrative Bulletin 3.5, which is the state's um, procedures for, uh, for contracts that the state enters into. And it, it includes um, a number of sort of procedures that the state has to follow when they enter into a contract. And what this is saying is that um, what you have to include in this bulletin 3.5 are terms and conditions that authorize the state auditor to have discretion to examine the records, accounts, books, papers, reports, and returns of contractors that provide services to the state um, and have that be in compliance with this new statutory requirement in um, 32 BSA 163. And the Secretary of Administration is directed to do that by October 1st of this year. And then section four of the bill is amending um, a state law requirement that prohibits a financial institution from sharing um, uh, certain personal information, disclosing that information under the law. And there is a list of exemptions to this prohibition. And what is um, amended here is on page four is just adding the auditor to um, this list of uh, exceptions to this prohibition against disclosure um, so that the examination of records or disclosure to the auditor um, is not prohibited under this section. And that would make this be in compliance with the other statutory change being made here, saying that the auditor could access these records. Representative Cooper. Okay, is this every contract that the state engages in? Is it just personal service? Do you go to buying trucks? Everything is up for examination. Um, it is, it doesn't limit, yeah, every, I mean, it doesn't limit the auditor's authority. Um, that being said, I think the auditor can speak to how many contracts they actually audit in the year. <laughs> um, I, I, don't, I don't know that they would have the, their office would have the capacity to audit every single contract. <laughs> Any questions about the words on the page while we have legislative council? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so I just want I'm to, happy to come back and answer more questions as you have. Great. Thank you very much. And more information. <laughs> I know I know your books elsewhere at 930. So um, unless there's any burning questions from here, we I just want to this is the perfect time for me to say uh, we are just hearing very introductory testimony. A few folks the second they saw that we were doing a walkthrough uh, wanted to testify on this. So we are going to hear from a few folks uh, if we as a committee decide to dig back into this in the coming weeks. We will take much more testimony and make sure we understand this issue more thoroughly. Today's just our sort of first first pass through this. So I just wanted anybody who's testifying to kind of be aware. I know there's a lot of concern about this bill that we're not, you know, moving at warp speed here. We're just taking our first look. So just wanted to say all that before we let Legend Council go. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Becky, for, thank you. for being here this morning. Um, I'd like to invite the auditor to, to come in. Uh, <laughs> 
give the office's perspective on S9. Thank you for the offer. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Good morning. Um, to follow up on the, the background from the case, it's really kind of interesting. It was basically a contract case. The contract was very clear, uh, Section 2.7, that said uh, an agent of the state, uh, if requesting records, shall be provided those records, period. No reason had to be provided. In fact, we had a good reason. We were looking at the performance of one care, not their core function, but a bunch of other functions where there were deliverables that required their staff to do work. And their payroll, as proposed to the Green Mountain Care Board, went from X to X plus in one year. And we, we were curious why. And that's it. That's the primary reason. The Green Mountain Care Board didn't ask for that information, nor did DIVA. So, and that leads to something I'm going to mention uh, coming into my remarks. So it was bizarre. Uh, for the See, that provision doesn't have anything to do with a 163 or 167 or even attachment C. It simply said, an agent of the state shall be provided these records upon request. And they said, literally, the state auditor is not an agent of the state. And I thought, okay, we're through the, the looking glass at this point. So uh, uh, your vice chair referred to this work as an expansion. I want to start with that. That's really important because five minutes before the Supreme Court's decision, we had the authority we're asking for here. Attachment C, which is part of Bolton 3.5, which is the procurement rules for the state, has a provision cleverly titled the audit provision that says, again, the uh, an agent of the state shall be provided records related to the performance of the contract upon request for audit and examination purposes. We've done that for years with no concern expressed by contractors at all. That gets to another concern that was expressed by the state. So they're not really changes. It's just going to take us back to the status quo from 25 minutes ago. And in fact, I don't know whether you had a chance to see it, but I sent a clip from the Senate debate on the floor, uh, some comments by former state auditor and minority leader uh, Randy Brock, Senator Brock, who said that. He said, I don't know what the problem, I'm paraphrasing, he said, I don't know what the problem is, but all this does is reinstate uh, what we thought were the rules 25 minutes ago. So that's what's going on here. It's not really an expansion. Furthermore, the court did something interesting. They made a choice, and that's their uh, prerogative. But, you know, for a long time, state and federal governments have been expanding the nature and extent of what they do. It's very complicated. It's massive. You guys know as well as anybody in this committee. State government doesn't work without contractors. Last year alone, a billion dollars was spent contracting for work on behalf of taxpayers. If we don't pass this bill, then it effectively says, ah, billion dollars. We'll worry about that later. Well, I'm the only person. This office is the only entity in state government that is truly independent. And I'll get to that uh, in a minute. So anyway, they're not really changes. They're not expansions, I should say. Um, this question, I'm glad that both Senator Hardy and Becky spoke to the concern expressed by some folks who testified in Senator Hardy's committee about confidential records. That was, in, in a way, sort of a shameless mischaracterization, not on their part, but on the, the lobbyists. HIPAA, personal health care records, are protected by federal and state law, period. <laughs> we have accessed HIPAA records about Vermonters multiple times during my tenure. You are not permitted by law to make them public, period. You can't. If somebody asked for them, I'd say, I'm sorry, the law says I can't do that. We have received and utilized tax data, personnel data, you name it, we get it, if it comes from state government, and in some cases from contractors. So the concern expressed about that kind of bugged me, because they should know better. You know, people representing hospitals know that HIPAA data is protected, and it is, and it still is, and it always will be, whether you pass this bill or not. Um, one lobbyist referred to the potential for unbridled power on behalf of the state order, I thought that would be nice, but that's not what we're asking for. Uh, they misunderstood in many respects, but I think as you heard from Becky and from Senator Hardy, uh, the only records that we would have the authority to uh, request and receive are those relevant to the performance of the contract, period. And so you'll know we've used that authority, as I said, before the Supreme Court decision, nobody questioned our authority. We've used it multiple times over the years. Good example, uh, when I first took office, we did a job uh, looking at the work of the contractor, I think they have a different one now, who was 
uh, asked by the corrections department to provide health care to prisoners, and we had to see their records, which included records about prisoners. Nobody questioned that, ever. Nobody questioned any of that until one care. So anyway, I, I'll miss the unbridled power, but I'm not really asking for that. The, the other one, which is kind of my favorite, is that the state sent three or four people in to testify in a couple of committees about the dreaded chilling effect, which uh, I think Senator Hardy referred to. The, assum the assertion is that the knowledge that your company might be audited would somehow reduce your interest in or willingness to contract with the state because you'd be scared of an audit by the owner. First of all, again, those <clears throat> that authority has been in attachment C for decades. Every single contractor that's working for the state today signed a contract that says you can be asked to provide records for audit and examination. Every single contract. So there's nothing new in that at all. Uh, the question of the, the chilling effect is bizarre to me. First of all, we've never had a chilling effect, and everybody knows that that provision is in statute. If they don't, they're not reading the, the contract and you know, kind of want to read your contract. Second, there are 12 states in this country that have explicit authority for state auditors to do exactly what we've been doing and what we're asking you to codify. 12 states, including Massachusetts and New York. No chilling effect that I'm aware of, and I'm pretty sure we would have heard about it, but it's not there. So I don't know where that came from, except who knows what, I, I can't comment on their motivation. Uh, the state also said, you know, BGS came and testified and said, look, we don't really need the auditor to do this because we as BGS and we have the procurement arm, we make sure that all the contractors uh, meet their obligations. Well, that's nice, and I'm sure to a large extent you do. However, first of all, you don't do GAGAS audits. That's generally accepted government auditing standards. You don't do audits. You might look at the deliverables and decide whether you're satisfied with the deliverables. That can be a different question than auditing a contract as it relates to the state and its expectations, which are sometimes broader than just the deliverables. Uh, so that's not the same thing. It's not apples to apples. If, if an agency says, we've got that covered, that's not true. And I can tell you from experience, uh, you know, 10 years now, that we've produced a lot of work that shows very clearly that, I'm sad to say, there are lots of instances where departments and agencies don't even report accurate, timely information to you about the work that they do. And there are lots of reasons for that. I'm not talking about <clears throat> corruption or incompetence, just that's life in a huge bureaucracy. So to say that we've got it covered and ignore all that is disingenuous in my view. Uh, also, um, what it would do to, to say to the auditor's office, you can have the information if the agency asks his company for it. So you're putting somebody between us and the source of the documents. That gives you, the bureaucrat, the authority to say, ah, oh, we'll ask for some of it, but not all of it, or we won't ask for any of it. We don't think you need it. Do you, is it really your intent as the legislature to say that the administration can stand between the auditor's office and an auditee? Is that, what, is that how you want it to work? Because that would effectively give the governor a veto power over audits that we choose to do. I don't think that's your intent. I certainly hope not, because that's a problem. That's a big problem. Um, I don't know what else to say, except I'll give you some background. I, I did some work under contract for then Auditor Flanagan in the 90s. And that was a pivotal time for state auditors around the country. Uh, historically, they had always done the financial auditing and some compliance auditing, all important stuff. But that's not the end of the conversation. That's the beginning of the conversation. Because GASB, the Government Accounting Standards Board, said to auditors around the country back in the mid-90s or so, look, that's great stuff, but there's more that you can and should be doing. Specifically, find out if the money spent by your program and your program your, are actually achieving the goals as intended by the legislature. Citizens have a right to know that. Program managers need to know that if they're not already evaluating their own performance. And certainly policymakers need to know that. But auditors weren't doing that at that time. Then they started doing that. Hit or miss over time. Now virtually every state auditor in the country does performance auditing. In our case, that's all we do. You know, we farm out the, uh, the financial and the compliance auditing. It's absolutely critical for you, let alone citizens and program managers. Uh, at the same time, from the 60s onward, as you well know, government grew dramatically, as I mentioned before, and became much more complex. 
and required, ultimately, the assistance of contractors for all kinds of things. I mean, look at designated agencies. That's $300 million a year. That's effectively state work, but is contracted. And you can find many more examples at that level. It's about a billion dollars a year. So you have you know, states now routinely doing performance auditing, and a significant part of all state efforts run through contractors. You really want to say at this point in time, no, we don't want the auditor to have access to the contracts, which represent a billion dollars of taxpayer money. Is that the forward thinking way to think about this constitutional office? So, you know, this is a bit of a dramatic flourish, but I, it occurred to me at 3.30 in the morning. Uh, just to wrap it up, you know, to paraphrase Martin Luther King, who famously said, the arc, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. With all due respect, the arc of state auditing bends towards transparency and accountability. People who oppose this bill are taking us backwards. I feel so strongly about this. I can't even, I hope you appreciate, you know, I'm a numbers guy. But I'm passionate about this. This is a big deal. Uh, question. So, Representative Jake, and Representative. Yeah. Uh, so, Mr. Hoffer, uh, do you think some of this misinformation or initial angst about the bill was because the bill didn't start out the way it's written now? It starts out with this bill proposes to amend the authority of the state auditor to examine the books and records of any contractor providing services to the state. That was in the original bill, I think. Right. The question right. is about relevant to the contract. But that was kind of already in uh, item 13 and attachment C of bulletin 3.5. So that was already there. That, that expectation on the part of a contractor has been there for decades. And furthermore, one of the letters, they didn't testify, but they submitted a letter. Seven people representing a bunch of healthcare institutions and so forth. Uh, they were the ones who first or initially spoke to, oh my God, we take protecting HIPAA data very seriously, as if I don't. Uh, and we're concerned about what will happen if this kind of information gets in the hands of the auditor. So, you know, they didn't, they're not aware or didn't want to admit that we've had that information for a long time. And you've never heard about a breach of confidentiality because we would never let that happen. One of the other lobbyists, I think for the contractors, uh, said, you know, the auditor is a political position and who knows what will happen down the road. Well, first of all, the governor is a political position too and everybody he or she appoints. But more importantly, I don't, literally do these audits. I supervise the work of professionals who are bound by the professional standards manual, which is really strong on confidential information. So, you know, these folks take their work very seriously and I trust them and you should too. But uh, is it improved by the tweaking? Yes, for sure. So I'm seeing a lot of hands up and we have more witnesses to testify. So I'd like to keep the questions, you know, kind of brief and then we definitely we'll have the auditor back if we pick this up. So, that means I have to answer quickly. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> I'm not good at that. Sorry. Sorry. Just trying to lay things on the table here so folks kind of understand this bill this morning. Can I? Two things. So yes, sir. Try to be quick. Um, in, in, am I hearing correctly that, that the court decision was that if Diva and uh, Health Access had agreed with the audit, they could have requested the records, but Absolutely. for whatever reason, they chose not to support the audit. Correct. Okay. Um, and can you speak a little bit to the um, the narrowness of that specific contract? Uh, when I was in the Army, I built bridges. If I built a bridge in New Jersey that fell down, wouldn't you want to have that included in your uh, audit of uh, a bridge built in Vermont? Yes, indeed I would. Uh, the the work of the office, we have used, um, in many cases, confidential contractor records on six or seven occasions during my tenure. I think if you add them all up between Gagas audits and investigative reports, we've probably done 50 or 60 during my tenure, and only half a dozen or so related to contractors directly, uh, and never outside of the scope, outside of the, the purview of the department or agency itself. It was both of them, as I think some, somebody pointed out earlier. So, you know, we're just not willy nilly saying, hey, let's audit a business for the heck of it. You know, that's not what we do. And furthermore, if it's small, I can't justify the allocation of our, some very expensive resources in my office. It's only for big stuff. Gotcha. And Hooper, did you have a question? Um, well, uh, Otter Hoffer, thanks for being here. Stick around from a couple of other witnesses, and I imagine we'll have you back when we pick up work on this. I'm going to have to leave in about 15 or 20, but I'll stick for a while if that's okay. 
I can answer questions as they come up. Sounds great. great. Thanks, Thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Secretary Farnes. Take the witness chair, please. Thanks for being with us this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> So, for the record, um, Douglas Farnham, Deputy Secretary for the Agency of Administration. Um, I'll try to speak quickly, given that this is a, an intro and a kind of high level. So, I'd like to start off by saying I have professionally been on both sides of the table here. I've been the aud in an auditing position and I've been the audited. So, I have a great deal of respect for not only the state auditor, but, but the office and the staff there. Um, the confidentiality concerns, I've, I've actually share the auditor's perception of their ability to protect uh, information. When I was at the tax department, I wouldn't have handed over information if I wasn't confident that they could have protected it. So I do think the confidentiality aspects of this um, aren't the primary issues to be concerned with. I do think um, it's ironic that um, the auditor closed with a quote by Martin Luther King and that um, I've heard some of the chilling effects kind of disparaged. I, I do think it's important for us to acknowledge other people's opinions and perceptions and being dismissive, I don't think is helpful to a thoughtful and productive conversation um, because the chilling effects were primarily cited by our racial equity director, Susanna Davis, and are in the context of the black indigenous persons of color community trying to represent their perspective. I do have um, a couple pages of written testimony that if the committee digs into uh, this bill more thoroughly, I think, um, would be important to consider. I think part of the, the problem with talking about this quickly is that the state of Vermont has over 5,000 contracts. And they range from the smallest, very basic licensing agreements to more complex service, uh, to construction, to contracts that are with entities that are not purely commercial in nature. So it kind of blurs the lines on what our expectations should be from those entities. So I think there's a huge spectrum. And one of my biggest concerns with this bill is that it casts a huge net to catch like the one care, one fish kind of example. I would say that my, in my opinion, I disagree that the data that was requested in the one care case was directly related to the performance of the contract because it was payroll data. What a commercial entity pays their staff is not relevant to the deliverables and the performance of a contract. In order for it to be a commercial relationship, it needs to maintain that separation. We can ask us what they're charging us, the rates, but we cannot ask them what they're paying their people. That is confidential business information that really should have nothing to do with our evaluation of a contract. I think the auditor's role is ex exceptionally important and their access to the records and oversight of state agencies managing their contracts properly should never be restricted. They should have access to every piece of paper that is involved in that process. And if the auditor feels that an agency is not overseeing a contract properly, that is an audit finding that should be published and shared with the legislature. And if the legislature feels an agency is not doing its job properly, that's the remedy for, um, but the oversight should not be a direct relationship between the state auditor and then the commercial entity. I think. Um, the auditor did ask, do you want that agency in between the two? And he presented it as a barrier. I, I look at it as the commercial relationship is between the agency and department buying services, buying goods. And that's who they're working with. If you have a situation where multiple parties are involved in great breach of contract scenarios, then that complicates it. And it makes our already difficult contracting system more difficult right now. Yes, we, it's massively important that the auditor look in and make sure the executive branch is doing its job in contract management. Absolutely, over a billion dollars. Right now we have even more because we have these short-term federal funds that are being deployed over the next uh, five years. And those are federal contracts as well. So we doubly have to make sure. And the auditor has produced valuable findings related to contract oversight in different agencies. So I think the role of the state auditor should be auditing the state of Vermont, should not be auditing private entities, should not be auditing commercial entities. And GAGAS audits, the clue is in the name, generally accepted government auditing standards. Should not be applying GAGAS audits to your private vendors, your commercial private parties. So I think those are the primary concerns. I know I'm trying to run through them very quickly, um, but I do think 
the, my main, the administration's main concern right now is the broadness of the issue and the impact it would have on potentially over 5,000 contracts. So I do think if the committee is serious in taking this up, the contracting situation at each agency and department is different. There are different cultures. There are different levels of sophistication. And I would say that the, the committee should hear from every agency and department to, to hear how it would impact their contracting specifically. I do think um, I took Auditor Hoffer's comments about BGS's response to HART. I do think that was perhaps a bit curt and perhaps a bit flip because they, the Office of Procurement does help and does provide some limited kind of structural guidance, but they don't perform. The, they don't provide the value that the state auditor does to that contract oversight, which I do think is ultimately an auditor's opinion of if the agency or department that's getting those contracted goods or services is doing everything they can to make sure Vermont gets the best value um, from that relationship. Representative Cooper. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Farnham, uh, GASBY standards are the gold standard in auditing. Is that close to a factual comment? Yeah, yeah I guess, yeah. GASBY is a, uh, I should know this off okay. Yeah. Um, I think GAGA standards are designed to audit governments. And I think that it's very important that governments are held to those standards, especially with smaller businesses. I don't think they're necessarily applicable to much smaller vendors. I, I heard that the auditor said he wasn't, you know, going to be going out and auditing a large number of small businesses. Um, but I think that the main thing in a relationship, in a commercial relationship, is the goods being delivered for the amount of money. And we should have a high level picture of the financial stability of that contractor, but it's inappropriate to go any deeper for a standard commercial relationship. So I would imagine since you hit specifically on wages, if uh, Vermont had a minimum wage that an out of state contractor might not know about, or the contract had a specific provision for a scale, uh, that would seem to open the door to effectively giving an audit the opportunity to look at what was happening in that end. I think under the current structure where um, there are certifications that they're complying with our wage laws, um, any federal contract, of course, is going to have to comply with, um, geez, I cannot remember words this morning. Davis Bacon, thank you. Um, so there are certain types of work where the wage information is already expected to flow through in a very regulated and controlled manner. But um, the question was simple. If, if the contract contains specifics on wage data, that should be subject to examination and audit. See if it's actually happening. It's sort of a yes or no thing. Yes. If it's, if it's related to the performance of the contract, which in, in a capital construction scenario would be related to the performance of the contract, yes. You related to Joe? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Silent. <laughs> um, Deputy, Deputy Secretary Farm, thanks for being with us. Any other questions from the AOA's perspective at this point? Um, so Representative Waters Evans and then Representative Chase. Thank you. I'm wondering, we just heard um, Auditor Hoffer say that, that when the Supreme Court decision was made, this is this bill would restore what was happening 25 minutes before that decision was made. Can you explain what the difference is the way you see it between what this would allow and what was happening in that, you know, proverbial 25 minutes before the decision was made? Like, what, what's the difference? So um, what was happening prior to the one care case is that generally the state author, auditor was asking for records which directly related to the performance and there was no disagreement about whether or not they related to that contract. So um, I would also say from working from the state of Vermont for a number of years, just because something was happening doesn't mean it was right. And, um, you know, the court's review of the contract shows we were being open and we were sharing because no one disagreed on what was being asked for. So it ended up being there was no harm involved, right? There was no conflict. The one care case was a situation where the state agency um, 
wouldn't demand those records because they didn't believe they're related to the case. Um, this would change it. The contracts on paper have always had the audit provision, but the state auditor is not referenced in the attachment C audit language. There's a tacit assumption that any document, well, there's a statutory authority for the auditor to audit any document which is received by the agency related to any contract, right? That's just part of the documents that the auditor has access to. Um, a plain language reading of attachment C language led some auditors to directly request records. I don't think that direct request should have been done in the past. I think it always should have flowed through the contract because a contract is a relationship between that state agency. And um, a good example is the Department of Taxes can have a contract with a contractor. The Department of Public Service can't come in and request a document, right? They're both part of the state of Vermont the larger entity, but they're separate legal entities from a contracting perspective. It sounds like the crux of the debate between the two positions. So thank you yes. for framing it up uh, that way. Representative Chase. Um, are the different types of contract versus like a, a purchase agreement versus a, a situation where um, the, the contractor would be acting as an agent of the state on behalf of the, uh, citizens? Like, is there a distinction in the types of contracts like that or are they all kind of uh, I think um, as you drift towards the situation where a contractor is acting on behalf of the state of Vermont, that's going to become more similar to a grant agreement, which a grant agreement um, profit is kind of not allowed in a grant agreement. So a grant agreement would generally have a much broader set of documents that's related. Like if this had been a grant to one care and the state auditor wanted to know if they were taking any of that grant and applying it to their payroll, that would have been an exceptionally pertinent question, right? Because they, they, that would have to be controlled. They're not allowed to profit off of a grant arrangement. We do run into trouble where, not trouble, but difficulty. Um, you know, there are federal standards for separating grants from contracts, but anytime you draw a line, things can get very close to that line. And as it gets closer to a grant from, as a contract, it becomes more difficult to differentiate what's an appropriate request about performance. And, and in our healthcare system, it is very complicated. It does have some kind of non-standard, non-commercial entities involved. And I think that also makes it a more complicated situation to, to evaluate. Not to mention all of the federal regulatory uh, pieces that we've touched on in earlier mm -hmm. testimony. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we want to dive that deep. Sorry. Hey, no, <laughs> totally fine. I think it's really important for us to kind of scope out what the areas that we need to dive into in order to really understand the ramifications of this bill. So appreciate you being with us this morning. Uh, we're we're going to be running a little bit late. And so I think we'll end up having to start 386 at least a few minutes late here. Because I'm going to give our last couple of witnesses a chance to testify. So I want to invite um, Secretary Naylor uh, to come up and give um, the agency's uh, perspective on S9, because I think there were some specific things you wanted to bring to our attention as we consider looking at this bill a little further. Yes. Um, thank you. Good morning. For the record, Sean Naylor, Secretary of Digital Services. So uh, I think you've heard a lot of great testimony so far about kind of the the, the pros and cons and, and challenges with this. Uh, where I sit, we deal with about 1,500 uh, technology contracts annually, so our amendments as a subset. Uh, and the agency digital services is charged with delivering what the administration and legislation legislature wants with regards to uh, technology services to assist Vermonters in getting the best programs and offerings. And, you know, I don't, I would say that bringing the, the concern around the effects of this to the vendor community shouldn't be considered uh, fear mongering. This is, I think, a valid concern, given that we have an instrument called uh, retainer contract pool, where we go out and we have a kind of a pre-vetted master agreement with uh, IT vendors to do work. And we know that most of the large companies in the, in the country do not participate. And we know because the work, the, the size of the amount of money compared to like the obligations of the state of Vermont are not worth it for them. 
And so we don't have the benefit of being a Massachusetts where our contracts are large enough and they can put the, the time in and negotiating. And so uh, I think a chilling effect, as has been described, is a real possibility and one you can't measure because we don't send out contracts and say, well, we expect all of these people to reply and if you don't respond, please tell us why, right? What you see over time is a reduced vendor pool, reduced choices and increased cost. And that is the, the effect. And so, you know, in that very real instance, when we have this, as it's written, right, um, the removal of involvement of the contract owner, you know, coupled with um, the broad documents that are listed, and then paired with the case that was the impetus for this. The concern is that the vendor community is not gonna dive deep into it. They're just gonna say, well, they wanted payroll information and now this is the result. I'm Microsoft, I don't feel obligated to do it. Why would I respond and wanna do business with the state of Vermont? And so it's whether or not it's, it'll be hard to measure, but I think it's a valid concern and one that should be considered um, as you take up additional testimony on this. Because we're, what we're looking to do is at the end of the day is we want to make sure that Vermonters have the most options and choices available. And the more restrictive we are, the less choices and options we will have to be able to provide services efficiently to them. Pause there, because I'm sure we'll be back on this. Yeah, I think, I think we'll probably hear debate on either side, but I think it's good to, that we have the concern generally laid out. Uh, Representative Hooper. Thank you. Yeah, do you find in your contracting efforts that it's 3.5 and put business in there that are more to the idea of we don't want to do business with Vermont in the financial services side of things? We have a lot of problems with people taking exception to a lot of stuff in 3.5 as opposed to what has been apparently going on for a long time. Um, well, you don't really get to know, right? Because the people that don't, the vendors that don't respond, don't respond. So how do you get to find out why they chose not to respond? And so it's it's hard to tease out what could be their motivation. I know from just uh, some informal conversations that things like indemnification and other things that are pretty rigid in this state contribute to um, a value analysis, right? And often the cost of a con, you know, the cost of providing a service to Vermont will be less than a larger state. And that value analysis is not worth it for them to go through the effort of bidding on it for Vermont. But that's deeper than what we're talking about here. That's down into the overall contract expectations of 3.5 sticks in. Um, well, no indemnifications in statute. I'm just I'm saying that these there's a lot of things that come into play as to why a vendor may or may not. This could be another. Sure. This is going to be the proverbial straw on the camel's back in some instances. Thank you. Anything else for Secretary Naylor at this point? All right. if, uh, for those who are here on 386, we have one more witness that we want to hear from on S9, and, and then we'll, we'll be switching gears. So thanks for your patience. I know there's a lot going on in here today. Um, Megan Sullivan uh, from the chamber, and thank you for being with us to give the chamber's perspective on S9. Uh, thank you for having me. For the record, Megan Sullivan, Vice President of Government Affairs for the Vermont Chamber of Commerce. It's nice to be back with you all. Um, so I know last time I was here, I was talking um, for restaurants, um, but uh, I think this shows the breadth of industries that the Vermont Chamber of Commerce um, deals with. We have members in every region of the state and um, from every industry in Vermont. Um, and so, you know, I appreciate coming in today during this sort of introduction because um, we have sort of broad questions and concerns that we've heard from um, our members about. Um, and those members are from industries that are varied, including healthcare, technology, uh, construction and general contracting, telecommunications, energy, finance, and banking. Um, and so before I get into some of what are those questions, what are those concerns, what are some clarifications that we might ask um, this committee and the state auditor to dig into as we, um, as this committee potentially looks at this, um, I do just want to underline 
the, the framing of this conversation and what we're talking about is about the authority of this constitutional office, not about the actions of a specific individual. Um, and the considerations being taken up by this body are for changes to the authority of that constitutional office. Um, and I think what we want to especially think about is that um, at some point, state auditor is either not going to run or the, the voters are not going to reelect him and, and we will have future auditors. Um, and that if there is a future auditor with less reputable motives than the current state auditor or uh, Martin Luther King, um, that there need to be guardrails in place to ensure that, that activities are being done um, in the um, manner um, that this body is expecting of that. And, and you know, I think just personally, one example I would give you is when I first heard about this, my thoughts went to um, the state in this body and the governor have gone to a length to ensure reproductive rights in Vermont, in, enshrining it in the Constitution, and that fear-mongering um, was used as a, why do we need to put this in the Constitution? The legislature is obviously going to protect that, but saying future legislators may not feel the same way, and we need to protect the rights of people to access that. Um, and so when I thought about this, I thought, you know, what if a future state auditor who did not agree with that decision came in and use that as an opportunity to look at, you know, how can I look at the contracts that the state has with the, um, the offices that provide reproductive rights who have contracts with the state? You know, are there abuses that are possible because it allows direct act access to these state um, contractors, including healthcare providers who provide these types of services? And I think it's, important for us to think about how could these be used by somebody who does not have, um, how could this authority be used by someone who does not have that sort of uh, moral standing that is saying that, you know, thinking about justice. Um, so the first question and concern that we heard about was around um, the clause that exists, as the state auditor mentioned in Bulletin 3.5 around audits um, and the authorized personnel. Um, and if authorized personnel in a can access state contracts or can, can ask for information from a state contractor and now the state auditor can do the same, does that create some type of confusion or duplication within state government of different organizations, different state agencies who are going to be requesting information? And pulling together the types of records, the, the breadth of records that are being asked for takes time um, and it takes personnel and, and it costs money to do that. Um, so if we're saying that it can be done by the state agency that oversees the contract, as well as the state auditor, um, that can create additional costs and confusion. It also, you know, I think for the legislature's perspective, are we having two state entities spending money to do the same thing. So I think looking at, is there a duplication of activities that would be going on here? Um, and how do we minimize the costs of that um, or the impact of that on a contractor? And I think that might be part of that cooling effect is knowing that there are, um, that they could be asked from different places for similar information. Um, so that's one area that I think we have we have concerns about. Um, another piece, and I'm glad that the state auditor brought up Gagas audits, um, and that um, I, you know, I would say I don't believe performance audits are all that the state auditor office does. They also do non-audit reporting, and it would seem to me under the language that non-audit reporting would be a way a use of this confidential contractor information. Um, and it's important to clarify that those GAGAS standards, while they may have some interpretation, are held to a higher standard than a non-audit. Um, and when you're talking about confidential information, the public or this body does not have the opportunity to examine that themselves. So if there's a disagreement between the state auditor's office 
and a private contractor of how information is being represented, this body or the public can't do their own examination. So it's important if we're talking about access and reporting on confidential information, I would agree that having those GAGA standards in place is important. But in the language here, it doesn't limit the access and use of that private contractor information to GAGAS audits. So, uh, Megan, I want to say that uh, if we go further on this bill, we're going to talk a lot about the Public Records Act and what is available to the public and what's not, because I think a lot of folks on this committee probably um, some of the things that we talked about in terms of HIPAA and confidentiality and things in the prior testimony this morning, that's a little bit over the heads of folks who haven't been in the weeds on that before. But I guess for the purposes of us framing our right. future conversation around this issue, what is the chamber's response to the assertion that 25 minutes before the one care case decision, it was kind of generally understood that the auditor could could ask contractors for this kind of information, and then the the, the case upended what was the general understanding that already existed. I would say that from what we've heard from our members, it was not generally understood that the auditor could call any contractor at any time and ask for information that we're discussing in the Winnegar case. You know, if an agency is under a performance audit by the state auditor's office, I assume that state agency would have notified their contractors, um, especially if it was to deal with their contracting. Um, and that if there was agreements put in place between the agency and the state auditor's office, that's one thing. But again, I don't see in this language that it, it limits the request to the performance of a contract, but I don't see, and maybe Becky would tell me I'm wrong here, that, that this limits the request to an ongoing performance audit. Right, so, so you could say, Joe Paver, I see you have a contract with AOT. We don't have an active, well, that's probably because they just paid. We don't have an active audit going on with AOT, but I have questions about the performance of your contract and I'd like to see your personnel information. Right, so maybe it's a clarification that there is that access to these contractor documents are through an active audit not just performance of the contract. Does that make sense? Um, it, it does. I think it opens up a lot of questions about what we mean by an active audit or the performance of the contract uh, in practice, but go ahead. All right. <laughs> no, thank you. So, so just clarifying what you're saying there. So this, so like an active audit within the administrative entity that's contracting with it would trigger then the audit score. So if the state auditor is the state auditor's office is auditing a state agency's um, contracting. So they're saying we have concerns about how the state agency is performing their contracting services or how they are overseeing contracts. And they open an audit on that state agency. And they say it's important in this audit on that state agency that we have access to the documents of the state contractors that are working with this with this agency. They have an audit going on of the state agency under which they're requesting documents. As opposed to just saying any contract, if there's 5,000 active contracts with the state of Vermont, regardless of whether there is an audit going on of a relevant state agency, a information on a contract could be requested if it's requested under the frame of a performance on a contract. So that sounds like a suggestion for us to put on the parking lot for uh, our future work on S9 when we pick this back up again. Um, we're over time, I need to switch gears somewhere, and Megan, before you leave us, if there's anything in particular you want to flag I think for us. another suggestion is that in state contracts, um, in 3.1, it limits the time to three years. You can request records from a state contractor for three years. I don't see that time limit here. 
So again, thinking about how far back can we go, how much money could that cost somebody if we had a state auditor in place who had, uh, who was using this authority in um, a less scrupulous way, could they ask for contracts related to uh, performance of a contract related to a contract from 10 years ago, from 15 years ago? Again, I, I Businesses in the state of Vermont pay a lot of taxes. <clears throat> and we are very happy to have a constitutional office that is ensuring that those taxes are being used well. Um, because our members, as they're paying them, want to ensure that, that they are um, being used well. So we are very supportive of the office of um, the state auditor. But we just want to make sure that if there is a um, change, whether it's perceived or um, you know, this is coming up new, uh, this is an opportunity to look back and say, do we have the right guardrails in place to make sure that, that this authority is being used um, in the way that our current state auditor is, is asking them to be used? Thanks for being with us today, Megan. Um, we are over time and need to switch gears to some charters that we promised we would look at this morning. So um, we will definitely, uh, if and when we pick this back up again, let you know. <laughs> um, so thanks for bringing the chamber's perspective. Um, so committee, uh, I would say we have heard uh, the initial uh, framing of this issue and voices on both sides about S9. Um, so uh, I have a number of notes and we'll pick our work back up on that in the next few weeks. Um, so thanks for thoughtful questions this morning. I know that was a lot. Um, just putting that bill <laughs> out for a walkthrough. I got a lot of requests for testimony and didn't want to dive completely into all of the various um, tangent issues uh, that that bill brings up. But I think it was a little bit inevitable that we would see little glimpses of it and um, probably more questions than answers this morning. So with that, we're going to turn the page. And um, finally, take up H386, the Brattleboro Charter Change. <laughs> so um, I don't know if the, the delegation wants to come and give us uh, the sales pitch first, and then we'll have Legislative Council walk us through the Charter Change. Uh, Representative Kornheiser, and you know, we're all here. We've got the Brattleboro 3. Call it in. Introduce yourself for the record and tell us about H386, please. <laughs> well, I'm Representative Emily Kornheiser from Brattleboro. Representative Molly Burke from Brattleboro. Representative Tristan Tolino from Brattleboro. And thank you for inviting us and for being willing to take this up. This um, measure has had a long journey so far. In uh, just a little background, in um, 20. 19, March 5th, 2019, in a 908 to 408 vote, the citizens of the town of Brattleboro voted to allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote in local elections, to vote for candidates for Brattleboro Select Board and representatives for Brattleboro's unique form of town meeting. Uh, then um, I have some comments about that, but it just sort of what happened is last year in 2022, the House approved this measure um, after a vigorous debate by a vote of 102 to 42. The Senate approved it after that. The Senate voted in favor of, on February 28th. Uh, on March 11th, 2022, oh, then the governor vetoed it in February, the end of February. And then March 11th, the House voted to override this. Governor's veto by 102 to 47. The Senate failed to override because of concerns about whether um, uh, youth voters who were select board members could enter into contracts. But I think that that issue has been settled, and I think that's something Tucker can talk about it. But um, he believes that the charter is sufficient to confer legal capacity for an elected youth voter to consent to contracts. And he said you could add a provision to the charter with, which authorizes youth voters to execute contracts in their capacity. So that's where we are right now. Um, Can I add one thing? Yeah. And actually, even before that sort of procession of voting and veto and more voting, in the biennium previous to yeah. that, the House actually um, passed this charter affirmatively 
and it met crossover and then um, the pandemic hit yeah. moments later. Right. And so we didn't really sort of do anything with So that's why it's been four years. Um, and I just want to read a little bit, um, and I have pages of things that we can give to the committee about research on youth voting. Research shows that voting is habitual. A person who votes in the first election they are eligible for is likely to continue voting consistently, while someone who doesn't will take several years to pick up the habit. 16 is a better age to establish a new habit than 18. Youth are affected by local political issues as much as anyone. They also work without limits on hours and pay taxes on their income and can drive in most states. 16 and 17 year olds deserve the right to vote on issues that affect them. In paying income taxes, youth are contributing money to a system in which they have no voice. Lowering the voting age can drive demand for effective civics education in schools. Students learn best when the material presented is relevant to their lives. Civics classes fall short when they teach young people how government works without any ability to actually participate in it. Letting 16 and 17 year olds vote will bring much needed relevance and productivity to civics classes. The youth vote has a trickle up effect on civic participation. Conversations about politics and local issues are brought to the dinner table. Parents and family members are engaged in civic life with the 16 and 17 year olds in their household. If we want to retain our youth, we must create conditions of belonging and trust. So there is a lot of research and we can distribute this. Um, and if I could just add a brief story. Um, my child is 18 and a senior in high school, so still at home, lots of you know kids. I personally um, left my hometown before I turned 18, so actually turned 18 in Vermont. Um, but turned 18 in January and so was able to register to vote for actually was automatically registered to vote through the DMV and registered to vote in our recent town meeting election and then came with me to town meeting this past Saturday as it was elected as a town meeting representative. My child is not like me. They're an introvert. They do not ever want to be a politician, but they've been, you know, hearing about politics at the dinner table, as I'm sure anyone in your family has for quite a while. And um, I was really and we have, you know, meaningful conversations at dinner, but I was really surprised at how much their focus and intent and interest in all of the sort of vagaries of local politics and what it means to debate an issue and all of those things really like just changed over the course of those the month in between when they voted for the first time and then when they joined our town meeting on Saturday. It was really like very inspiring to see how much more engaged they were in local politics and just like that really some that really short difference between just hearing me talk on about it and being able to really participate themselves. It was very cool. They're about to leave home in like two months and we could have like really cemented that habit much more if we'd had another two years of this. Representative Hanka. Thank you. Do any of you have any data as to where else um, 16 and 17 year olds are allowed to vote? Sorry. Data on what? Um, where else in the United oh, States? Yeah, I think there are some things here. Yeah, so I don't, we, yeah. We did uh, previously, the last time we talked uh, about this, we had that data. Where is it? Um, oh, also Nancy Pelosi is in favor of this, just <laughs> FYI. And I just want to remind the committee, on this bill, we had tried to do an introduction previously. We're just doing an introduction and walkthrough. It, we are not moving this bill. Some of the other charters that we did last week, we are looking to move today. So I just wanted to make that distinction for everybody in case anybody's got anxiety about us uh, doing this one today. It is not my intention to try to move this, this one today. <laughs> um, so uh, and, seeing a lot of hands pop up. And you can get back to me if you don't have that data now. Tacoma Park, Maryland did in 2013. Um, but we have sort of, we can send you like a full of it. We're not the only one. We're yeah. not the first ones. So, Representative Higley and then Representative Morawicki, I saw a flurry of activity over here, but I'm not sure who still wants to speak, so we'll <laughs> figure that out. <laughs> Representative okay. So, I'm a little surprised to see that this is back again. Uh, I had a real hard time squaring what we just did on the floor a few weeks ago as regards to not allowing 16 and 17 year olds to get married without the parental permission. 
I also remember back during the uh, uncontrolled legislation when uh, it was changed from an 18 year old to a 21 year old to be able to purchase a firearm. And the debate seemed to go uh, center around the cognitive reasoning ability of the uh, younger folks. Uh, so again, um, I, you know, I, I just, can, can you square that for me? Can you square how uh, a majority of the folks in this chamber voted to not allow 16 and 17 year olds to marry with parental permission in certain situations, yet you want them to be allowed to vote now? So uh, I, I'm happy to take a shot at it. Um, and uh, I wasn't there for the floor debate. I will acknowledge that because of the appropriations process. But um, there's a distinction in what the capacity of 16 and 17 year olds have that's important to voting, where voting is sort of a measured reflective process there the challenge for young brains is, is more an impulsive decision making and both of those have a nexus around impulsive decision making and i think that that's the distinction and i i believe that two years ago we shared and we can pull that back up the research on sort of the difference between i don't it's not slow thinking and fast thinking it's but it's impulsive, impulsive thinking and deliberative, deliberative. Yeah. yes um I, as one of the sponsors of the um the, the marriage uh, prohibition, you know, for 16, 17 year olds, there has been a lot of research done by the Vermont Commission on Women and other organizations about the negative effects, particularly for young women, of marrying at an early age. And uh, so there's, there's, a, there, there's, there's harm that can be done to a, a particularly a younger, younger woman in being allowed to marry. And a lot of times, it's sort of a coercive kind of situation there. And it also leaves um, young women open to trafficking. So it's, it's a very complex situation. It's not just the people are saying, oh, well, we're in love, you know, and somebody said, well, if you're in love, you can wait two years or wait a year or whatever. Um, I think that it also maybe comes from an earlier concept where um, if, a, if a, a young woman gets pregnant, that they should be married. And I think that you know, I think more has have changed about that, about whether it's, I mean, that they could do at the age of 18. So I'm, I'm just trying to respond. And I, I don't think there's any evidence of negative repercussions for individual yes. youth voters if they started voting early. There's a lot of evidence that- I have it a could. lot more to say on that, but we won't have the time right now, but I appreciate you both, all three of you explaining uh, that particular. Uh, differentiation. Representative Merwicki. Um, I don't expect you to have an answer to this right now, but uh, I feel like when a town overwhelmingly votes for us, I'm very hesitant to go against that. Do you recall the percentage of this vote? It was, uh, it was uh, the number here, it was 908 to 408. Quite overwhelming. So like quite, yeah. 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 And there was a, a few high school students, this is in 2019, who were very, very active working on it. They were at the polls, getting signatures. They were very, very um, engaged and upset when we were not able to pass it. Yeah. And I, um, I agree with you, Representative Murky. I've, in fact, voted for charter changes that I wouldn't vote for in my own town in, within this body because I think it's important to respect communities' charter changes in that way. Um, Representatives Hooper and then Boyden, and then I really want to have Legislative Council do a walkthrough before we, Why I don't want to do the whole debate about this bill today. We don't have time for that. <laughs> Why did this devolve into a discussion about individual people under 17 having the legal right to form contracts when you basically don't contract with an individual, even if it's the mayor, it's the body. Neither of, none, none of us are in the Senate, and so I don't think any of us were privy to the Senate. I think there was like a background debate there right before the final veto override vote, and I think Tucker could probably speak to it better than we can. We have a cup of tea, we turn it over, we look at the shapes, <laughs> and we try to understand from that what the Senate's thinking is. <laughs> Very Hogwarts of you. Um, Representative Boyden. I think it's a statement, but I think this is a really important conversation to be had, especially as we as a committee consider the future of town meeting and uh, local elections or town elections. 
um, and getting more of our youth to participate. I know when I was at my local town meetings, I was one of the small handful of young people there. <laughs> so um, as we look for more participation and keeping town meeting alive in Vermont, it's this participation, participation excuse me, that really matters. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. We're Thank gonna, you so much for inviting uh, us. Council, take us through the words on the page for today, and then we'll uh, push pause on 386. But thank you all, uh, the Brattleboro reps, for joining us together, uh, showing the, <laughs> the full delegation support. Uh, I'm honored to have you all here today. Thank you. This is very important to our community, and so we are very available for any and all questions or research requests. Oh. It's nice to mean I haven't been in this room since it was transitioned. To you, you, it's, 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 how often we get asked about it at all. Okay. <laughs> it's, 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 it has not left the mind of our community, even if uh, it feels like it should have after <laughs> over four years. <laughs> well, thanks for coming down. I know you all are busy. Thanks. Mr. Andrews, thanks for being back. And, uh, Taking us through H386. Well, good morning, Tucker Anderson, Legislative Council. You have in front of you H386 as introduced, which contains the Youth Voter Charter Amendments uh, for the town of Brattleboro. Uh, the bill, largely speaking, does two things. Uh, the first is that it allows 16 and 17 year olds to vote as youth voters uh, in the uh, annual representative town meeting in the town of Brattleboro and in their local elections. I'll give you some background and history as to how youth voter in its current context came to be with respect to these charter amendments uh, as I do the walkthrough. Um, the second thing that it does is it cleans up a little bit of the charter. Uh, this was bundled with the vote that happened in 2019 uh, I'll quickly note those corrections as I go through, but largely what it does is it eliminates uh, references to offices that no longer exist with respect to the town school board. Um, I'll note that as I go along. Uh, you heard some history about uh, these charter amendments that were passed in 2019. Uh, one thing that I would note is that what you see in front of you is different from what was passed by the voters in 2019. Uh, and what are those differences? Well, primarily what was passed in 2019 by the town of Brattleboro directly amended the definition of voter in their town charter. And the way that those charter proposals were presented would have allowed anyone who was present on voting day who was 16 or 17 year olds without respect to citizenship or any of the other qualifications to vote in an election to actually vote in the town meetings. The second thing uh, is that by amending the definition of voter, it had a much larger context for the town elections than what is presented in H386 as you see it, because voter uh, occurred throughout the charter with respect to a number of different offices, including uh, potentially those that are appointed by the select board. Um, finally, the other uh, implication that perhaps caused some debate and confusion as this bill moved along in multiple iterations over the last four years, is that by amending the definition of voter, there was the direct implication that those individuals could hold an elected office, not just vote for them. However, the materials that were presented at the time presented this as youth voting, not youths holding office which is how we came to the legal questions and debate around whether a 16 or 17 year old could, for example, consent to contracts on behalf of a municipal corporation. I will state my legal analysis and position on that upfront, which is that consistently over the last four years, it has been my analysis and position that that question is resolved simply by the passage of this charter. The General Assembly has the power to grant capacity to any person in statute. And that is what the charter, as it originally was written over the last three years, did. It said that 16 and 17 year olds had capacity to hold an elected office and to perform the duties of that office, which included, if necessary, the execution of contracts. 
to resolve any ambiguity about a potential conflict between common law and statutory law in front of you, there's a provision added to the end of the charter that states expressly and unambiguously that youth voters have capacity to consent to contracts. That provision is unnecessary, but it is put in here so that the debate ends expressly around that piece. Section one of the bill, consistently the same throughout all the charters you'll take a look at this morning. This is the expression of approval from the General Assembly for the charter amendments. You'll also note that in each one of these sections, one that you evaluate this morning, it will tell you the date on which the voters approved the amendments. In this case, it was March 5th, of 2019. Section 2.1, and we're on page two of the bill, has introduced defines youth voter to mean any person who is 16 to 18 years of age and is otherwise qualified to vote under state law. So this essentially provides that the youth voters meet all of the qualifications to vote under Title 17, but are 16 to 18 years old. That's where the exception was. Uh, Tucker, if you could back up just a minute. Uh, I believe you just got through telling us how this particular charter bill is different from the previous one. Yeah. <clears throat> you just made reference to in section one uh, in regards to voters approval, approved proposals of amendment on March of 2019. Is that Legit, I mean, should yes. be, be, but it's different, right? The, the voters approved amendments that did not achieve the legal end that they intended it to achieve. And over the last four years, various iterations of this committee have come in to clean up and actually accomplish what the voters wanted to accomplish from a legal perspective. But you're saying that that wording still needs to be in there in the beginning and then throughout the rest of the charter it explains how it's different? Correct. This is something that is actually done in almost all of the charter bills that are subsequently amended by the committees of jurisdiction, whether from a policy or legal standpoint. Section one expresses that the voters approve whatever the contents of the charter are. And then the charter as a component of state law is amended at the will of the General Assembly. And there are some instances where there are inconsistencies and the committees of jurisdiction have determined to take out section one, just so that it's not stated that the voters approve something that you change whole cloth from what they approved. Um, in this case, the youth voter amendments are consistent with what was approved by the town. Thank you. So I will say before I go to Representative Cooper, it's my intention to complete the walkthrough of H386, have us take a short break so that folks can take a bio break, et cetera, and then come back and do the, the second look and potential markup and vote of the, what I would consider more simple, straightforward charter changes that we looked at last week. So just setting the agenda. Thank you. Sure. So I heard this question has popped up in my head often. Once a town proposes and adopts a charter change and it comes to us and we don't take it up immediately, it never dies. It can be taken off the table at any time, 10, 15, 20 years later. It can be resuscitated. And as we, I, I think we covered this in some of the initial discussion of charters like some of the day one stuff we did together. This is all state law. It relates to the powers of a specific corporation, in this case, a town. But this is, this is your baby. This is the General Assembly's law. So you actually don't even need a proposal from a municipality to tinker with the charters. This is really the, this is a delegation of authority and it's at the whim and will of the General Assembly. You don't want to quote Justice Dillon about us breathing life into the municipal <laughs> and all of that again. That was right. I, I, I have that quote tattooed on my <laughs> So the town would have to actively withdraw by vote a proposed charter change. They could absolutely take that step. It might be more cost efficient to reach out to the delegation from the particular municipality and say, we don't want this anymore, but. 
Moving on to section 2.2, I'll note two things in the section. First, the struck language that you see are those technical corrections around the board of school directors uh, for the school districts that no longer exist. Um, the second thing that I wanted to note is this is an area where youth voters is inserted and I'll tell you the offices that are listed in section 2.2 of the charter. Representative town meeting members, the select board, the listers, trustees of public funds, moderator, first constable, and a second constable. Those are the elected offices that can be voted on and can be filled by the youth voters. Section 2.3, this includes the youth voters in the representative town meeting provisions of the charter. Moving on to page three, section 2.3A. This is the charter specific provisions around early and absentee voting. Um, and it includes here a provision that covers uh, the youth voters who will be old enough to vote on election day. It's the same provision that is in both general law and this charter for 18 year olds currently. In section 2.4, this is the inclusion, again, for consistency of youth voters and provisions governing representative town meeting members. Moving on to page four, section 2.5. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you, I don't believe you did this this year, Tucker, but could you explain, since this is unique to Brattleboro, what representative town meeting is? Yes. Uh, <laughs> There is a general law provision that allows any municipality in the state to convene a representative town meeting where uh, certain legislative decisions at the local level, including setting the budget and proposing the budget, are determined by a representative body not dissimilar to the House of Representatives. Um, I believe that in Brattleboro, this is the only town, by the way, that has decided to adopt this uh, model, it is 140 elected members um, who go and then represent the voters at what would typically be carried out, for example, in a floor vote municipality by the voters of the town. So youth would be eligible for one of those 140 positions. Yes. And when is that determined? When is that election for those 140 individuals? I actually don't know the date of when they are elected by uh, the town, but I can find that out for you. So just thinking, you know, like if a 16 year old wants to be one of those 140, they have to be 16 at the time of that election for that body of 140? Yes, <clears throat> that is because uh, under the provisions that I very quickly went through, the term youth voter is used for members of the representative town meeting and you have to be at least 16 in order to meet the definition of youth voter. Okay, thank you. Representative Marwicki, just to answer that question about voting, uh, Town meeting members, representative town meeting members in Brattleboro are elected on the first Tuesday in March at town meeting, but they don't hold their town meeting until, well, they just held it last weekend. So two or two, two or weeks later. later. Thank you. So the election happens just a couple of weeks before the meeting typically. I, I love that we went down that particular. This bill just, it, it does all the framing that I love. Even if you don't love the guts of this bill, it, it brings up all the, the usual charter questions. So it's perfect for that. <laughs> Thanks. It's an opportunity to flesh out the representative town meeting, which usually is just a blip on the radar. For example, when you're doing the special authority for Brattleboro and all, <laughs> over the last four or five years for them to hold their representative town meeting electronically. And then we kind of skip the explanation of what exactly representative town meeting is. <laughs> Representative Thank question. you. Just as a follow up, if this bill were to move forward and we were to pass it out of this committee, I think we need to have a little conversation about um, the eligibility of someone in terms of age 
like does will that person have to prove that they're going to be 16 by the first Tuesday in March when they would be duly elected by the general public? Um, and how would that be proven and who would take the proof of that and as a um, you know like a, an affidavit who would who would determine that? So I just want to flag that for the committee. That it's, Why does it matter? Well, it, bring, it, it, matter? Brings, it brings up a good question. So, so maybe I can help to, to sort of to sort of push push that uh, into a little bit of a clearer place here. How would they know? It's Brattleboro. I mean. Well, so here, here's just a quick, a quick question. If there's any question about the eligibility of someone to run for any office in the state, that's typically a complaint-driven process. It's not that we check that they're eligible on the on the front end. It's it's that they are they they are themselves attesting their eligibility by filling out a consent form, and running for office, et cetera. And then if there's a complaint about it, that might bring it to light. Isn't that typically the process for any eligibility? Have to be a little careful in distinguishing state from local offices, but yes, it is largely a complaint driven process where someone's eligibility may be contested and a contested eligibility goes first before the board of civil authority in the town to answer the question about with whom uh, you would register as a youth voter. The answer would be the town clerk and um, there's an explicit reference here, at least for the early and absentee voting provision, that you have to file and register with the town clerk and fill out a form as prescribed by the town clerk. Very similar questions came up during the um, non-citizen voting discussion for the city of Montpelier and the provisions they put in place for separate voter checklists that would be administered by the town clerk. All right, section 2.5, we're on page four now. This includes youth voters um, express authorization for them to be members of the select board, so it's included there. Section 2.11, this is the uh, new language that I was talking about earlier. This is express authorization for youth voters to consent to contracts in their official capacity. It states that a youth voter who is elected to a town office shall be capable of performing all duties and exercising all powers of that office, including the formation and execution of contracts relating to the office or official duties. So again, that first part is a restatement of what is assumed when the General Assembly gives someone capacity to hold an office, that yes, we're giving you authority to hold this office and you get to exercise all the duties um, and authority of that office. Representative Hanson. Since I really didn't take part in the discussion when this charter change was presented um, previously in the legislature, I don't know the answer to this, but I feel like I remember that there were some contracts that 16 and 17 year olds were not capable of signing because of their age. Am I remembering that wrong? The discussion that came up and call them largely objections based on the common law. There is a common law doctrine called the infancy doctrine. The infancy doctrine largely states that people who are under the minority age do not have capacity to consent to contracts. Now they can complete a contract, but it is at the risk of the entity or person who is contracting with them because the infancy doctrine doesn't say that the contract is invalid. It says that the person who is under the age of minority can always back out of that contract in the future. There are exceptions to the doctrine. It is a very well fleshed out, very complicated area of the common law. One thing that I will note is that under the common law, the age of majority is 21. So unless a state has already lowered the age of majority, the default under the common law is that no one under 21 years of age has the capacity to consent to a contract. Vermont is 18 because you have a statute in Title I that says that the age of majority in this state for all purposes, unless otherwise accepted, is 18 years old. So you already have a statute which has lowered the age to consent to a contract from 21 to 18 from the common law to a statutory standard. What the charter did as introduced in the past is said, 
essentially, and again, this is an implied provision, it is an assumption, is that 16 and 17 year olds in the town of Brattleboro have capacity to hold those offices. What follows from that is they have the capacity to carry out the duties of that office, which might include consenting to contracts. The other thing that I have consistently testified about in this area is that uh, with respect to the positions here, these are on boards. The board is consenting to the contract. The voters vest the ability to make those decisions in a legislative body. The youth voter is a member of that body that has voting capacity. It is not likely that you're going to have uh, someone under 18 on a select board carrying out contracts in their individual capacity on behalf of the town. I'm not aware of a provision that would invest that power in an individual member of those boards. So just to be totally clear, the section 2.11 elected youth voter authority language makes explicit what your legal analysis all along believed was implicit. Yes. It is sufficient, but maybe not necessary. I <laughs> uh, appreciate that distinction. Section um, 4.1, if you're ready to move along, um, this is another edition of youth voters uh, in the charter references to the select board. Um, and the next amendment outside of some technical corrections in section 10.3. In that section uh, adds youth voters to um, representative town meeting membership again. Section three of the charter states that the act shall take effect on passage. So committee, I think we should uh, break until 11 o'clock um, and we'll put a pin in H386 for the future. Uh, representative Hooper. We could potentially vote this out today, correct? Well, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. So why not? So we all voted on this, except for the three of them. Sounds like she no. Did. Okay, so let's just back up. <laughs> this is new by new, new committee, new general assembly. So you were a yes. All, all of the reference, all of the references to previous testimony uh, are appropriate to an extent. But we really do need to consider this as if we're doing it for the first time. We can't just sort of say, yeah, we, a lot of us have seen this before. We can never really do that, even though we're all bringing some of that past experience. Uh, some of us are bringing that past experience. I, I would, before we vote this out, want to hear from some people to talk about the context that it exists nationally, some of the historical importance, people from the town of Brattleboro who support it. I imagine they're they're. So we, we would want to do a little more work on this before we pass it out again. So just that. And also, I made a commitment to the committee that we would warn that we were going to do March vote. So for the other charges that we're going to look at after our break, last week we did an initial presentation of those. Today we're going to do a formal walkthrough, markup, and potential vote on those because I have given notice to the committee and via the agenda to the public that, that we would consider those for a vote. Um, I would say I, I wanted 386 to be on the table so that folks would have the opportunity to go, oh yeah, that's that one <laughs> today. <laughs> we actually tried to get an introduction on it earlier. Um, and given that the three members from Brattleboro are all on money committees, it makes it challenging um, to get them all in. So uh, so we were delayed until today. So uh, don't want to don't want to dampen anyone's enthusiasm for 386, but we're not going to vote it today. Um, I wouldn't call it enthusiasm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. So uh, let's adjourn. We'll come back uh, uh, just after 11 now. I want to give us at least 10 minutes, and then we'll um, switch gears to pick up uh, our work on some of those charters we saw last week.